judges going back at the wall. See you later! Jose Altuve homers for the second straight game. Swung on and drilled at deep center field. It is high. It is far. It is gone. All rise. Here comes the judge. A swing and a drive to deep right. Away back off the pole. Francisco Lindor. And he checks one to right. See you laser. And with one mighty swing, it's a brand new game again. A three-run walk-off home run for Justin Turner. And it's gone, a two-run home run. Brian cracks one in the air. It's got a chance. Gone. Get out the tape measure. Long gone. Hey everyone, welcome to 1225 Live. My name is Alexa Dat, and it is Hot Take Tuesday today here on the show. We are going to have Cardinals outfielder Tommy Pham join us in just a little bit. He's going to grade my hot take from last week where I predicted he was going to take home some hardware. What does he think about that? Plus, he's going to talk a little bit about Marcel Ozuna joining the Cardinals as well as his really intense uh, six-day-a-week workout routine, which includes a lot of time in the gym. So Tommy Pham coming up in just a little bit. Stay tuned. We also have Anthony Cashman joining us in just a little bit. He's going to give us his hot take for the 2018 season. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, plus, he's going to give us a little bit more information on uh, what he believes about CeCe Sabathia saying that the Yankees are the hated team in baseball. Uh, returning to that mantra. So uh, we will get his take on that and so much more. Uh, by the way, we want to start the show off, though, with something that we all saw on uh, on Twitter and Instagram last night. This is Charlie Blackman doing his best impression of uh, fangirling so hard because Charlie Blackman not only might be one of the best outfielders in baseball, but that doesn't mean he can't get excited about meeting his idol. Him and Shaq hanging out. Shaq did a fool, man. This is pretty cool. And uh, literally from his caption, he said he was fangirling so hard. So um, we want to know from you when you fangirled so hard or when you were a huge man fan of a player or, you know, of a celebrity, maybe an artist. Whenever you were a huge man fan or, or a fangirl, send that in to us. If you have a photo you want to share, we'll share that here on the show. So that is our question of the day, and that's how we want you to participate. Also, because it's Hot Take Tuesday, we might as well have you give us a hot take, too. If there's something that is absolutely burning on your mind that you want to share with us today on the show, we will share that with everyone uh, a little bit later on, so make sure you get those in right now. But like I mentioned, Anthony Kastrovitz is joining us, and we're going to start off. Anthony, since it is Hot Take Tuesday with your hot take, give us your hot take for 2018, the season uh, that is just uh, almost upon us here in the next few weeks. Well, I'm going to take my make my hot take a little more immediate uh, just okay. in this free agent season. I'll have you, Darvish, going to the Twins. That'll be my hot take, something that maybe wasn't obvious going into the winter and maybe is still not obvious because um, there's, there's other competitive situations that are maybe more exact or, or maybe more clear, but um, but the Twins, you know, coming off the wild card burst last year, and I, I just, I just see them as the team with maybe the most momentum to really uh, do something bold in the bidding there, and to go that extra year, uh, you know, which is something that a lot of times is what this comes down to, and the relationship with Thad Levine, of course, former uh, Rangers assistant GM and now GM of the Twins, so a lot of things line up there, and I, I think it's a place where he could be comfortable. So that'll be my hot take. You right. Darvish to the twin. I like that. That's a that's a really great hot take. Uh, Castro Vince, give me the least likely place you think you Darvish could end up this offseason. Japan? I don't know. Least likely? <laughs> <laughs> Going back to Japan? No, I mean, like, uh, among teams that are looking for starters and, yeah. and that sort of thing. I mean, honestly, like, from this pool of teams that we've been talking about, it just feels like the Rangers are maybe the least likely, despite, um, you know, use wishes. I think that's really what this boils down to is, he, that's a place where he's really comfortable. He's got a home still in the Dallas area, and um, it, it, it's the team that was so good to him when when he transitioned to the United States in the first place. But it just doesn't seem like they're going to be that team to make the major financial commitment. And again, maybe maybe they work it out to where it's not the best offer on the table, but it's the offer he's most comfortable with because it's the place where he's most comfortable. That that could happen. But um, you know, as as much as uh, there's a lot of sentimentality there, I just I just don't know if that's a great fit right now with. What they're trying to do this winter they're, they're not trying to you know do that major free agent contract yeah and uh it's interesting too i think teams are i think slowly starting to look at his full body of work last season instead of just paying attention to uh those couple games in the world series where he was 
uh, not successful. So I think that time has started to heal that wound, and uh, hopefully teams are, are a little bit more interested in signing him. But we will see. Uh, Cashman's. We've been doing a segment here on the show because MLB Pipeline grades the top 10 prospects at each position. Uh, you can check that out, by the way, if you're watching at MLBPipeline.com. So we're kind of piggybacking off that, and we are naming the best player at each position. Today we're doing third baseman, and I know you have a thought on this. Give me your best third baseman in baseball right now. Yeah, well, first of all, Alexa, thanks for having me on on possibly the most difficult position <laughs> day, uh, honestly. When you look around the third base landscape right now, it's incredible. Uh, and I'm going to go with Josh Donaldson. I'll defer to Josh Donaldson. You look at the five-year track record, basically, and um, the, the guy's still unbelievable. I know he was banged up last year, but the last couple months, uh, you know, August and September, he was maybe the best player in baseball statistically, and it maybe got lost a little bit because the Blue Jays weren't really in contention, but, um, you know, he was on fire once he got rolling again. So, uh, so I'm deferring to him with the understanding that Listen, a year from now, I mean, this, this could just as easily be Manny Machado, Nolan Arenado, Jose Ramirez, I mean, Chris Bryant. There's so many great young third basemen, which is so much fun. But I, I'm still going to defer to the, the Wiley veteran here and uh, a guy a lot of teams would have loved to got their hands on, obviously, this winter, and the Blue Jays didn't move him for good reason. Yeah, unfortunately, that calf injury has me uh, at pause a little bit sure. because of those 113 games. I'm going to go to a guy who's out there day in and day out. And, yeah, this was a really tough category, but to me, it's Nolan Arenado. And one of the big reasons it's Nolan Arenado is because of his defense, right? His defense yeah. puts him there, right? He's got the most defensive runs saved at third since his debut in 2013. The next most at third is Manny Machado, and he's a distant second. Uh, gold glove for each season he's been in the majors. He wows us daily with these acrobatics. Plus, he's a huge threat at the plate, which is the most interesting part. Finished 2017 with the best slugging percentage in the majors with runners in scoring position. Best in baseball since 2006. Albert Pujols uh, pulled that off. So he finished top 10 in MVP voting in the last three seasons. And he's only getting better in my eyes, honestly, I think. Uh, and then with that walk-off home run to complete the cycle last year, I I'm just so excited how he follows it up for uh, his yeah. encore in 2018. Yeah, that's my backup number one. And um, that's a good backup to honestly, have. Yeah, it is. And and the thing is, it's, it's a nice conversation because I mean, really Donaldson and Arenado are really cut from the same cloth. When you talk about competitive fire, the way these guys play, um, you know, these are real leadership presences and real just uh, warrior type presidents presences on, on a field. Um, they're very much, you know, very similar players in that regard. But yeah, I mean, Arenado is obviously the younger guy. Uh, better defender, and, and Josh Donaldson's a terrific defender at third base, but Arenado's the best defensive third baseman probably in baseball, especially now that Manny Machado moved over to short. Now it's probably no question. Um, and, you know, people, you can adjust the numbers for Coors Field, and, and maybe the offense numbers aren't quite as strong, but the guy still produces at a tremendous, uh, you know, all-star caliber rate on the road as well. So he's just a great ball player. Yeah, you also got to take into account the division in which he's playing in. You know, I know a lot of people mention Coors, but uh, he doesn't get enough credit hitting off some of the best pitchers in the game. So uh, pretty pretty incredible that he's able to do that. All right, so we want to ask you a couple of questions, some uh, news information that we saw come down the wire here. Uh, most recently, CeCe Sabathia was on Hot Stove the other day, and he was kind of following up on his comments that he had made about uh, the Yankees being the uh, hated team in baseball. How do you feel about that being the mantra for the Yankees this season well I know they're hated here in Cleveland so you got that right <laughs> especially the way the division series played out but yeah just in general like you know last year it just felt so awkward like the Yankees were this lovable underdog type team and it was a little ridiculous because they just paid 80 million dollars for their closer and you know they, they still had a, a lot of uh, you know veteran pieces on that team but obviously it was a team carried more by the the quote-unquote baby bombers and and by my boy Brian Hope's book, by the way, that's the, the baby poppers for you. I'm, I'm trying to give a plug to my guy. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it's clearly a team. It, it didn't fit to, to be the underdog. So this fits much more is to be the hated team, the team that stocked up this winter. And they didn't do it in free agency, obviously. They're, they're still staying out of that realm of, of you know, plucking people's, uh, you know, best players out of free agency. But instead, they pluck them in the trade market for next to nothing which only adds to the frustration when, when things break so well for the Yankees. Like, oh, he doesn't want to go to the Cardinals or Giants? Well, sure, we'll take him. Why not? Yeah. Um, with, with John Carlos Stanton, of course. So they had a, a terrific winner just from that move alone um, was enough reason to hate the Yankees, I think.
the best part about it was he was like, I didn't even think this was a controversial statement. He was like, when I was in Cleveland, we absolutely loved the Yankees. They were the team we wanted yeah. to beat, you know, uh, day in and day out. So I don't know why this is uh, news to me. He was like, I, I contacted the PR staff. Like, am I going to get in trouble for this? I did not think that this was going to make waves. But uh, obviously, <laughs> it's, it's the Yankees and, and everything with the Yankees makes waves. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Speaking of the Indians, by the way, they will remove the Chief Wahoo logo from their uniforms from the 2019 season. And uh, Castro Vince, I know you tweeted about this. We'll share that in just a minute. But a couple of statements we want to share with everyone here from Commissioner Rob Manfred. He said, the club ultimately agreed with my position that the logo is no longer appropriate for on-field use in Major League Baseball. And I appreciate Mr. Dolan's acknowledgement that removing it from the on-the-field uniforms by the start of the 2019 season is the right course. And then Indians owner Paul Dolan also said, while we recognize many of our fans have a long standing attachment to Chief Wahoo, I'm ultimately in agreement with Commissioner Manfred's desire to remove the logo from our uniforms in 2019. Casterman, what are your thoughts on this decision? Well, I, I grew up here in Cleveland. I grew up with Chief Wahoo. I, you know, adore Chief Wahoo from a, a sheer uh, sentimentality of it being a part of my childhood. I, I think there's a lot of things in our lives that are like that. Um, but I, I totally agree with this decision. It, it's probably past time to go. I mean, you grow up and you see more of the world. You, you meet more people. You come to understand that, you know, a, a red faced big nose feather-wearing, triangle-eyed representation of human beings is not exactly a flattering portrayal. Um, so you can understand why Native American groups would be uh, offended by the logo. So as popular as it might be here in Cleveland, um, you know, you, you step outside of this region, it's a very different attitude towards Chief Wahoo. So I understand why, you know, MLB wanted to distance itself from the logo. And it was a difficult conversation, a long conversation with the team. And as you see from the result, it's pretty much a compromise. I mean, they're still going to be able to sell the logo. People are obviously going to be allowed to wear the logo. Um, but I, I would just, yeah, I, I tell people, I totally understand the, the sentimental attachment to the logo. Just just think about how it's perceived. If you're standing face to face with a Native American who's offended by it, you know, that person has every right to be offended by it because look at it. Um, but, you know, you have every right to wear it to the ballpark. So, um, so it's a thorny issue, and, and people are really upset here, Alexa, uh, you know, by and large, the responses I'm getting to this news. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about a cartoon on pajamas that guys are wearing playing a boys game. So I think I ultimately think there are bigger issues, and, you know, you can still wear it in the stands if you want. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought your tweet pretty much uh, said it perfectly. You know, people are more up in arms about the Chief Wahoo logo and seeing that on the field and seeing Francisco Lindor and his smile and his performance and uh, everything yeah. that he comes along with. So I thought that that was a, a pretty... A uh, great way to sum it all up. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, some some moves. Not hot stove moves necessarily, but uh, maybe lukewarm stove moves. Uh, cash yeah, events here. Royals, right. yeah. Royals trade Brandon Moss and Ryan Buckner to the A's for a pair of pitchers. But this could have an effect on uh, Eric Hosmer potentially. How do you believe that this could affect his future? Well, it could because the Royals save about $5 million, and, and every penny counts when you're trying to put together the largest contract, largest free agent contract in franchise history. Um, so every bit counts, and, and uh, you know, so that, that's the obvious move there. And, and, you know, they had some starting pitching depth, but, but really that move was about saving money, and they've had a couple moves like that this winter. Um, you know, so Hosmer is, I've said it all along, Alexa, that the Royals are the team to bid with their hearts as much as their heads, if not more so. And so it's always seemed to me that that's a really good place, really likely place for him to land when you look at the landscape of needs at first base and the number of first basemen available. And lo and behold, here we are, you know, cruising into February and this guy's still unsigned at 28 years old. So you can see where this is probably heading. I know the Padres are in the bidding and, you know, maybe they'll step up and add the extra year, whatever it takes to make it happen. But the Royals have always made the most sense. Um, you know, from a competitive standpoint and with this trade with the A's, it's another example of them taking a step back competitively because, you know, they, they've rid themselves of a couple nice bullpen pieces this winter, but it's, it's been all about saving some cash and, and hopefully making it work with Hosmer so that he is part of their next competitive group, whenever that might be. And maybe it happens immediately and, and they surprise some people in 2018, or uh, maybe they rely on his youth, his relative youth as a free agent. And, you know, it's a couple years from now and, and he's still a productive player. But um, so we'll, we'll see where that marriage leads. But, yeah, the, the, the trade, obviously, you know, it, it was less 
less discussion about the trade itself and more about what it could lead to. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure Royals fans would love to see Eric Hosmer back there. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. The Brewers reportedly reached an agreement with reliever Matt Albers for a two-year, $5 million deal. What's the next step for the Brewers now that, uh, th I mean, they seem to be so far at least the most uh, recent winners of the offseason? Yeah. Um, hey, anybody who does anything becomes an off-season winner. Right? Yeah, it's, a sh it's a short list of teams who have done something, so not hard to get on that list. But yeah, they really shook up the market. And Matt Albert's really nice pickup had a really nice year for them, or for for the Nationals last year. So, um, so you know they they've done some work to uh, to add to what was a pretty good bullpen last year. Um, but obviously, you know they're, they're still in need of that starting staff, uh, in my opinion, a lot of people's opinions. Their owner Mark. Mark Adonacio was saying over the weekend it's now the realm of possibility that that they still add somebody in free agency. But obviously, you know, the, the crowded outfield they have there, Domingo Santana being a really attractive trade piece, you know, that's that's a means to get some pitching without burning any major dollars, uh, which might be attractive to them. So they're, they're going to be really interesting to watch these next few days, few weeks, whatever it is, however long this hot stove season bleeds into spring training. Um, and they make that NL Central so interesting as well. Yeah, it's incredible, though, the way this has moved, right? Because it's like molasses. It can't move any slower, yeah. I'm telling you. It really can't. Uh, so because of that, you came up with several interesting trade scenarios as we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs, trying to figure out what to do here. The one that caught my eye, though, was Manny Machado to the Cardinals. Why do you believe that could be a marriage that could work? Well, it could work on paper just as a team that has a young starting pitching depth um, which, which is, of course, what the Orioles are seeking, you know, ready or near ready major league starters uh, if, if they are going to move Manny Machado and be obviously positional need on the Cardinals. Um, you know, they they're still looking for help in the corner infield and they have the, the pliability of Matt Carpenter. You know, if they acquire a first baseman, Matt Carpenter go third, they acquire a third baseman, Matt Carpenter could stay at first. But, um, you know, they, they obviously have peppered the Blue Jays with requests about Josh Donaldson all winter. Um, Machado is, is in the same boat as Donaldson as a pending free agent. And I think uh, in, in Machado's case in particular, the odds of re-signing him uh, after the winter are, are probably, uh, you know, not in the Cardinals favor, you know, to an extreme degree. So that's why, you, you know, for any team to go after a one-year rental is, is a big risk. But, uh, but in terms of matching up pure needs and what the Cardinals have to offer, what the Orioles would be looking for, it makes a lot of sense. I don't think it's particularly likely trade scenario, but it's certainly one that would make sense on paper. So, Castro Vince, with the improvement by the Cardinals and the Brewers, and uh, I'm assuming more moves by the Cubs to come, but we're not 100% sure, how tough do you think this NL Central is going to be this season? Uh, it's quickly shaping up to maybe one of the more interesting divisions of baseball, maybe the most interesting division in baseball, um, because, you know, the, the Cubs showed some vulnerability last year. There's no doubt about it. Now, granted, that was coming off a World Series run, and a lot of times teams coming off World Series run show some vulnerability the next year. You know, this, this past year, they didn't go as deep in the postseason. Still went the NLCS, of course, but it's just a different vibe when you're not that, you know, team with the target on your back quite as much. So, um, and the Cubs still have some questions on their pitching staff that they're, you know, trying to work through. And you Darvish is an option for them. But the way the Brewers came on last year and pushed them every step of the way, and now clearly, you know, making some major waves this winter. The Cardinals have left no stone unturned this winter and add Marcelo Zuna and, and probably have more to come. Um, you'd like to see them maybe add more to that bullpen, but um, you're going to have Tommy Pham on today. Big Tommy Pham. Fan, I'm a fam, 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 <laughs> whatever how you want yep, to say it. Yep. Um, you know, you think about a full season of, of Paul DeYoung and Tommy Pham and those young starters, that, um, you know, Luke Weaver and maybe Jack Flaherty. I mean, they, they got some really nice, you know, depth and, and pieces that are going to be, pieces that, that showed up last year and, and had kind of a breakout and I have them for a full season. That's, that's all positive. Um, so it's a really interesting division. You know, I, I really, I, you think back just a few years ago when it was routine for, for the central to have three legitimate October candidates and we might be back to that here again in 2018. Yeah, I think this division is just going to be fun to watch. I mean, I feel like that Cardinals outfield is going to be uh, really electric with Pham and Marcelo Zuna and Dexter Fowler there and uh, Alex Ray is coming back. And I feel like the Brewers were so close to making it into the postseason, uh, you know, are going to, you know, just absolutely take a run at this division, which is not something that we would have said uh, at the end of last year. So uh, mixing it all up, not having it just be uh, Cubs, 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 I think is going to be a uh, pretty electric. All right, we got a lot of Phillies fan love uh, in our comments today, Castrovins. I don't know what's going on, right. but people are very excited about the Phillies. Brad wants to know, the Phillies need a starting pitcher. Uh, who is on the market that you believe that the Phillies could scoop up? 
Well, you know, I don't see them necessarily. Uh, I, you know, the U Darvish, Jake Arrieta is is probably not in their wheelhouse right now. Although they do have the long term finances to do something like that. I just you just assume uh, those guys go with a more clear contender. But yeah, hey, maybe maybe they step up in, in the Lance Lynn and Alex Cobb tier. Uh, I'm not sure, or maybe a lower tier beyond that. But just in general with the Phillies, I like their approach where. You know, they, they got to look respectable in 2018. They took a step back last year, last year uh, in that, that rebuilding. It's supposed to be a steady ladder, and they took a step back. There's no doubt about it. And next year, they're going to be clear enough in the books long term to really potentially make some major noise. By major noise, of course, I mean maybe Manny Machado, maybe Bryce Harper. Um, and But when you're to have that conversation with those guys, to sell yourself on those guys, it would help to be back on that upward trajectory. So that's what they're working towards this winter. That's why they signed Carlos Santana to the, the the contract they did, which in this year's market is a major contract, three years and 60 million, you know, until the other night with Lorenzo Cain, he was the, you know, that, that was the top end of the position player spectrum. So, um, and, and they really beef up their bullpen as well, which, which is important. So, so I, I like the way that they're not just, you know, continuing to just sit around waiting for next year's free agent class to come along, you're seeing some a little more sense of urgency this winter to where, look, we want to be a good team. We want to be a good ball club. Maybe it's not a postseason ball club in 2018, but it's a team where we can more realistically sell our prospects. Uh, you know, I don't mean player prospects. I mean our prospects as an organization to a free agent of the caliber of a Bryce Harper or a Manny Machado. Yeah, I think uh, Phillies fans are going to be very excited to see another season of Reese Hoskins, Odubel Herrera, yeah, yeah. and uh, Carlos Santana there. And then they're just going to have to wait and uh, hopefully win it big in the free agent market next uh, offseason. All right, Castrovin, so some sad news in baseball as we heard that former Padres and Diamondbacks GM Kevin Towers passed away. And we're seeing you know, an outpouring of support and personal stories, touching stories on social media. How is he going to be remembered in baseball, do you believe? You know, he'll, he'll be remembered as uh, a, a gunslinger type, you know, and that old school GM mentality in a new school environment. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a fun way, in a good way. This guy got after it. You know, he got after life in general and um, really just 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 had that, that, that cool old school killer instinct of, of really wanting, you know, to, to make his ball club better and and leaving no, no stone unturned to do so. And um you know, my my interactions with him were he was he was just the coolest guy in the room at any given moment. You know, that's who this guy was. And so it's it's really inconceivable the, the way, you know, cancer struck him the way it did. And, you know, the, the lost weight and, and just the it didn't take the fire out of his soul by any means. But it's just this is one of those major bummers you come across with this awful disease for this guy to be taken down his mid 50s and um, the, the personality that he had. Um, it, it just doesn't match up, you know, with, with seeing this end. It's it's really sad day for baseball. It's a sad day for a lot of anybody who came across this guy is sad today because they know that the guy he was um, and, and just a respected figure of the game. I mean, you, you spent 15 years in one spot as a GM. Uh, you know, that that's an incredible run uh, that he had in San Diego and then, of course, went on to Arizona. And, you know, he had a great career and uh, he made a lot of friends in this game and, and you know, he was always so good to me and, and so many others in our media landscape. He was just a, again, he was such a cool guy and uh, it, it's just such a, 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 you know, a disappointing and, and sad news today. Yeah, absolutely. On social media, I was seeing a lot of people in different positions around baseball saying, I'm in the position I'm in today because of Kevin and because of what yeah. he did for me and because of the opportunity he decided to take on me, uh, giving somebody, you know, maybe not, uh, didn't have the, uh, the, the background or the uh, experience and putting them in yeah. a position, and they thrived because he believed in them. So, uh, yeah, really nice words. And, and Cash Friends, I appreciate you sharing those with us here today on the show. And I appreciate you joining us and for your hot take and all uh, your great takes <laughs> as usual. And we'll talk to you soon. All right, Alexa. We'll see you. Thanks, Cash Friends. All right. Uh, by the way, we've been talking all day about being a fangirl or man fanning for either your favorite athlete, your favorite musical guest, uh, whoever that may be, whether it's in baseball or not. We're talking about how Charlie Blackman got to meet Shaquille O'Neal. And he was like, I fangirled so hard. And we were talking all about Shaq to the fool and all of that. And he was like, Shaq, just put up with me because that's what Shaq does. He's a really good guy. Uh, so anyway, if you had a Charlie Blackman fangirling moment at any point uh, throughout your life, make sure you share that with us today on the show. That's our question of the day. And that's how you can get involved today in the show.
All right, we also do Hot Take Tuesdays every Tuesday here on the show. And last week, my hot take caught a little bit of attention. Uh, it spread a little bit around on Twitter. And Cardinals outfielder Tommy Pham, it caught his attention, too. He responded. We're going to have him on the show here in just a minute. But in case you missed my hot take, here it is one more time. Your 2018 NL MVP is going to be Tommy Pham. Tommy Pham, Tommy Joe, Pham. this is a guy who we watched all last season, and he absolutely dominated. 300, 400, 500 season last year. Only Stanton, Votto, and Arenado had a higher war than Tommy Pham, who accomplished this feat in just 128 games. 23 home runs, 25 stolen bases. He wrote down his goal to be the first Cardinals player to be a member of the 30-30 club. All right, so that was my hot take from last Tuesday. It's Hot Take Tuesday again here today. And Tommy Pham, actually, you saw that video when I posted it, and you responded. You were like, can we be friends? Because what other uh, way is there to respond to a video like that? But when you first saw that hot take, what was your reaction, Tommy? Oh, man, it was, I mean, I was excited, you know, for someone to think I could be the MVP. You know, that's, that, I mean, it says a lot. Um, says a lot about, you know what people are starting to believe in me. Um, just, you know, I, I need to keep working. I need to keep working. Yeah, I mean, man, listen, though, your slash line last year was so impressive. 306, 411, 520. You finished 11th in MVP voting. I'm thinking, I mean, your name is right up there in the category with some of the greatest players in the game right now. What was, you know, so impactful? What worked so well for you last year that you're hoping to carry over into 2018? Um, striking out less compared to 2016, you know, that helped, um, sticking with my routine, you know, a lot of times when, uh, when players get in trouble, you know, they want to change this, change that. You know, I just, I stuck with the same thing. Um, uh, I made very, very small tweaks and, um, I, I played every day, you know, in the past, you know, I was, I was never given an opportunity uh, compared to last year. And, um, you know, that, that really made a difference. You know, when, when you're playing every day versus, you know, I play three games, sit three games, you know, it's, it's different. The Cardinals have made some additions this offseason, by the way, uh, you know, to help bolster their, their chances in the playoffs, adding Marcelo Zuna. When you first heard that Marcelo Zuna was coming to the team, what was your reaction? I was excited. Cause he killed us last year, <laughs> you know, he killed us in Miami and he killed us in St. Louis and Marcel, Marcel could hit good pitching. You know, he's not one of these hitters who just, you know, they, he, he pieces off of, you know, the four or five starter, you know, he hits, he hits the aces. I remember last year he was squaring up Carlos and I, you know, when, when someone's squaring up Carlos, you know, that opens my eyes because that doesn't happen a lot. And, um, you know, he's, he's a great hitter and he's a great defender. So he, he's really going to help us. I, I'm, I'm super excited to have him as a teammate. All right. Since it's Hot Take Tuesday, Tommy, give me a hot take for the 2018 season. I'm not letting you off the hook. I think Carlos is going to win 20 games for us this year. You know, I don't think he's ever done it. I think he's going he's gonna to win 20 games for us. And um, that's going to help push us into the playoffs. He I is... Uh, He's a really special player in this game. He has, you know, one of the one of the best fastballs with movement and uh, and an electric slider. All right, Tom, we got a fan question from Danielle. She said, "Is there a player you grew up idolizing, or that you currently model your game after? Somebody that you uh, either watch footage of or that you just love uh, how they play?" There were there was five players I, I really enjoyed watching when I was younger. Derek Jeter, he, he was my favorite. Um, I, I, I was a shortstop back in my prime. And, um, you know, so Jeter, A-Rod, Barry Larkin, uh, Griffey, Ricky Henderson, and uh, Barry Bonds, they were my favorite players. Um, I felt like most of those guys had that speed-power combo, and they, they played great defense. You know, I'm... I've, I've always been, you know, uh, and, and a, a plus runner, you know, because I played football and basketball. So when I transitioned to baseball, I was 
I had that speed element to me and I saw these guys hitting home runs and stealing bases. And I was like, I, I need to do the same thing. So uh, uh, I wouldn't say there's one player, uh, you know, those, those names I just named, you know, Barry Larkin, he was a 30, 30 guy. Yeah. A-Rod, of course, Barry, you know, it's, that's a pretty good list. Yeah, it's a great list. It's also uh, an amazing accomplishment to be a dual threat like that. So uh, good luck to be able to accomplish that, the 30-30 club this season. Uh, all right, so we have this game of questions we want to play with you, Tommy. And the way we play this right. is it's rapid fire. I ask you a question, and you give me the first thing that comes to your mind uh, as you answer the question, all right? All right, let's go. All right, we've been uh, searching through your Instagram. What's the fastest you've ever run on the treadmill? I'm at 24 right now. Oh my goodness. I'm at 24. Yeah. I'm at 62. I'm at 62 with no <laughs> incline, man. You're killing me. You're crushing me. This video, I was shocked. I was like, I, I, this looks photoshopped. But yeah, uh, that's that's pretty impressive. All right, you met, you met Christoph Porzingis. Uh, a lot of people know him as the unicorn. Give me your favorite nickname someone's ever given you. Uh, I like Fantastic. Actually, you know it. I was, I was, uh, I, I received that nickname actually in AAA around 2014. Um, one of one of my favorite fans, you know, was, I just remember calling me one day fantastic, and I was like, I like that. It has a nice <laughs> ring to it. Um, so I, it's sticky. All right, cool. Um, I'm glad you're not uh, sick of hearing that yet, because we've been uh, saying that all year here on the show. All right, uh, we saw also on Instagram you were eating a steak in Vegas. This looked amazing. It made me. Uh, Super hungry for lunch. Favorite food of all time, though? It's the easy one. Crab legs. You know, my, I, I have uh, one. Of, my grandma used to actually take my twin sister and I to a the Binion's Horseshoe Seafood, uh, all-you-can-eat seafood buffet every weekend, you know, because she gambles. And uh, she used to gamble so much, she received points. So she would take me and my twin, and I'm... I, I mean, I, the love started at a at a young age. I mean, I would put ice cream number one, but I mean, I'm gonna stick with the, the crab legs. I love that. People... Yeah, I'm a huge seafood fan, so uh, that's great. And uh, shout out to your family there too. All right, you are from, uh, or you you play in St. Louis, and I know that uh, you know Nelly pretty well, Dirty Mo there, and uh, he's got some pretty great songs. Give me your favorite Nelly track of all time. Ei. Ah, love yeah, EI. I, I remember the music video. I, you know, he, <laughs> he he pulled up in the old schools and, you know, he did the house party and everything. Uh, EI. Yeah, love EI. That's a, that's, a, that's a throwback for sure, but that's back from, from my day. All right, you're from Vegas. You got this awesome Vegas tattoo. I was admiring it earlier, man. The, it's such a work of art uh, that you decided to put there on your arm. What's the best place to hang out in Vegas, though? In the... Now, you know, I do know the nightlife a little bit in Vegas. Uh, <laughs> as far as the the night the night scene, you know, for, for someone like me, I, I, I like to go to Dre's, you know, they, they have they usually bring a, a great performer and they, they you know they they have great shows there. You're gonna have a good time. Um, and somewhere where you you know, you go with uh, four or five friends, you have a great night. All right, speaking of Vegas, you got a Vegas connection. I know uh, you and Bryce Harper were catching up back in the day. Where is he going to sign next offseason? Oof. You know, Bryce hasn't told me anything. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've known Bryce since he was like 14. I remember seeing him in the cage, and I was like, where does this guy go to high school at? And they were like, he's still in middle school. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, he was my size. I'm, I was like, he's going to be special. Sure enough, he is. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of speculation out there. You know, I, I don't really like to go into all that. You know, he, he's played for the Nationals his whole career. You know, I think it would be a great a great story for him and his legacy. You know, if, he, if he's able to play for – you know, his that one team, his whole career, because you don't really, you don't see that anymore. But I mean, things happen, so who knows? Yeah. All right. Love it. Yeah, you could be the uh, modern day Tripper Jones. All right. Last question here. What's more exciting, stealing home for the winning run or hitting a walk-off home run? 
feeling home for the winning run, oh, I've, I've never done that. So that has to be the most exciting thing. You but, know, but you've um, hit a walk-off yeah. before. Yeah, I have. But, you know, I've never – I could just imagine stealing home to win the game. Like, that's – right there, that might be the most exciting thing in baseball. But how about this walk-off here, though? Tell me what was going through your head when this ball hit the bat. Uh, I was so happy because I, everyone uh, everyone on my team knows I don't like to play extra innings because we don't get paid overtime. Uh, <laughs> so – so, uh, you know, when the moment presented itself, I was like, all right, walk off, baby. You know, I stepped in there and, and sure enough, um, I got I was down in the count actually really quick. So, you know, it kind of changed. I was like, I just need to put the ball in play. And when I battled a little bit and I got the uh, got the ball in the air, I, I knew it was gone. And I, I was just extremely happy because I've never I, that was my first walk off at the time. And uh, I mean, every everyone in baseball as a position player, you know, you, you kind of deserve a moment like that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're going to deserve a lot more moments like that, Tommy. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, congratulations on all your success so far. And we're really looking to see uh, what you got in store for us for 2018. So uh, good luck coming up this season. Thank you. Have a good day. Big thanks to Tommy Pham for joining us. Uh, pretty awesome and got a lot of information there. Hopefully, if you are a Cardinals fan, you are tuning in. And uh, he's got all the latest info on where he believes Bryce Harper is going to end up next year or where he would like him to end up. So uh, thank you again, Tommy, for joining the show. All right, by now you know the Mets super fan Callie, who all she wanted was 500,000 retweets, right? That's pretty easy. All you got to do is uh, go on the Internet and make that happen. Well, she did. And because of that, she is going to head to City field on May 18th to celebrate her prom. Uh, that's going to be pretty cool. But the best part about it was she's going to have a very special date who uh, surprised her at school. If, in case you haven't seen this, take a look. Congratulations, Callie. Now she's got a date and the date that she absolutely uh, would have wanted from the start, Mr. Met. So awesome job there uh, by the Mets. And by the way, we're going to have Callie live on the show tomorrow. So if you want to hear how this whole thing happened and how big of a Mets fan she really is, we're going to talk to her tomorrow about all of that. Uh, Noah Syndergaard, though, had uh, an interesting thought. He thought, well, Mr. Met has a date to Twitter. Does that mean that Mrs. Met needs a date? I know a guy. Ha, ha, ha. By the way, I think 25 years old is a little too young for dad jokes. I don't know, but uh, that's just me. No, I might need to, to work on, on your jokes there. Um, all right, so our question of the day, biggest man fan or a fangirling experience that you've ever had? We had a bunch of people send in some good ones. Now, these are all baseball fans who were sending them in, so we did a little uh, cross-sport here, obviously, because when Charlie Blackman met Shaquille O'Neal, that was combining baseball and basketball. So uh, we have Ramon who said, I met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at Yale University in 2014. That was awesome. Yeah, I bet that was pretty cool, Ramon. So thank you so much for sharing that. Matthew, who's a baseball fan said my favorite fanboy moment was when I wore my Gene Machi jersey to a Giants road game in 2014. The lovable middle reliever was ecstatic I had his name on the back and he gave me a ball during BP. I can't even imagine what his reaction was when you call out to him and he turns around and sees his name on the back of your shirt. That's amazing. And the fact that he rewarded you with the ball uh, is exactly what you should have gotten. So uh, thank you, Matthew. Mark said I was at a steakhouse and I turned around and Eli Manning was in back of me. My wife yelled at me to turn around. Good eyes by your wife to recognize Eli Manning there. 
pretty cool. And uh, the fact that you are a baseball fan but also still appreciate football is nice to see too. And then Jeff said, uh, and he wrote a whole story here, mine was definitely getting a chance to see Craig Biggio, and he was at a signing in Cooperstown after he was inducted into the hall, which they do, and a lot of fans come by and, and see him. He said, I had it all planned out to be cool. Uh, but when the time came, I was nervous as a cat, and I spit out something about enjoying watching him play for 20 years. I mean, if you're going to find something to say, that's a, a pretty good thing to, to come up with nervously in front of him. Uh, nicely done, Jeff. He said he did say that he liked my older brick pinstripe jersey. Definite fan moment. So uh, man fanning there for Craig Biggio uh, is probably one of the highlights of your uh, baseball fandom. So thank you, Jeff, for sending that in. All right, our final story here. I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with Javier Baez in his offseason, but he's had a lot to celebrate. And one of them is the fact that he is going to be a new dad. Congratulations to Javier Baez and his beautiful wife. Uh, pretty cool that these two are getting uh, exactly what they wish for. They are going to have a baby boy welcome him into the world soon. His girlfriend's name is Er Marie. So congratulations to the two of you. And uh, we can't wait to see your new baby boy and what you guys name him, because that could be pretty interesting, too. All right, that's going to do it for this Tuesday edition of 1225 Live Hot Take Tuesday. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Tommy Pham, for joining us. Uh, and all of that interesting insight and information, as well as Anthony Castrovins, who came up with a hot take of his own. If you missed any of it, you can check it out on Facebook. We're also going to have Callie, the Mets super fan, who's going to take Mr. Mets to prom tomorrow on the show, so don't miss that. It's all right here on 1225 Live. We'll see you tomorrow, everyone. Take care.